Plant Phenome Journal webinar for today um, is Dr. Colin Tim, a research scientist at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and uh, Nathaniel Cow, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, is also involved in this project and was the first, first author. Uh, they're going to be talking about non-destructive automated workflow for analyzing diverse leaf morphologies using computed tomography. Um, if you do have questions as the presentation proceeds, go ahead and throw them in chat. Uh, when we get done to the end, I'll read off any questions in chat and then open up the microphones uh, for any further questions to our two presenting authors. So without uh, further ado, uh, Dr. Tim. Thank you, Seth. Um, thanks for being here, Nathaniel, to help me out too. Um, I'm showing you the title slide here, uh, which includes our um, extracted cover image, which shows you the how we found leaves using the algorithm. So these are actual plant CT scans. Nathaniel uh, false colored the leaves green uh, to show you how his algorithm was able to identify plants under these conditions. Um, I wanted to motivate the uh, project a little bit um, because it was partially a, a project that came from having an opportunity, having plants going at the right time and everything just kind of lining up. Um, so. I'm interested in plant biology because plants are very sensitive to their environment. As we all know, they have to be, they cannot uh, run away from any threats in the environment. They have to be able to respond uh, in place and change their behavior so that they can survive uh, different threats to their existence. Um, a detailed understanding of this plant response or for the typo could be used uh, to identify signatures of changes in the environment, uh, whether that be signatures of climate change or signatures of human activity. Um, so I had a project where I was working on um, some plant response uh, work at APL. And during that time, APL um, had purchased a CT scanner, um, which they were using for studying how, um, uh, how blasts affect humans, actually. So they had a, reason, a medical grade CT scanner. Uh, but when they purchased it, it wasn't 100% utilized. And they said, hey, does anybody have samples they want to try? right in the middle of the plant stress experiment. I was like, please sign me up. Let me see what we can get when we run our plants through it. Um, and what it really turned into for us is what could we learn if we had that same CT scanner in a phenotyping greenhouse, what could we do with it? So just to show you the early motivation, uh, let me know if my videos aren't starting. And that one on the right might take a little bit. Uh, our first set of experiments was actually a um, high temperature stress on tomatoes uh, and you can see the effect of high temperature on these two example plants. And this was pretty consistent. This was an endpoint measure. This is the day before we harvested our plants anyways. We thought we would CT scan them and see what happened. Um, and we got these really nice images, which are uh, pretty cool, I think. Uh, but the question was, now that we did this and tried this, what, can, what else can we do with these scans? Uh, we brainstormed a bit with our um, internally and with our engineer friends and identified that we could look at things like branching patterns, leaf area, perhaps roots would be cool to see. Uh, maybe we could uh, 3D print these plants. Um, then we took uh, a little bit of work into each of these and Nathaniel was actually able to pull out leaf area in just a few hours after looking at this. I was like, how did you do that? That was crazy. Uh, it was so fast to get us this really otherwise difficult to measure uh, phenotype um, through these CT scans. Uh, it was at this point, I, I wanted to point out that I, I didn't do this alone. I reached out to expert uh, consultation, uh, including Mike Gore, Dave Weston at Oak Ridge to say, is this really something? Is it really cool that we can extract leaf area so readily from plants? And what do we do with that, right? Um, what we determined was that we needed a better study to to demonstrate the non-destructive leaf area uh, metric that we had found. So we went ahead and designed that study. Um, uh, ultimately, what we did is we took three different plant types, a soybean for a broad leaf with very good, easy to separate um, leaves, uh, tomatoes, which have that those texture and curling, uh, and then wheat as our challenge plant for a grassy, stringy plant that might be hard to detect leaves. And we looked at them over time um, with a stress condition. So the stress here was a, a low water and it was pretty um, empirically implemented. We either watered our plants three times a week or one time a week um, and looked at phenotypic changes over time. Here's a pictorial 
uh, description of that experimental outline. Uh, we have uh, week two, three, four, and five plants for soybean, tomato, and wheat. Um, I have another picture of this uh, soybean plant that did not survive the low water process, which is really cool. Um, we got a really uh, different response with these plants. Here's that picture right here on slide, my unnumbered slide here. Uh, so we scan these plants um, weekly uh, with this treatment. And ultimately, just to fast forward through all that, we were able to show that we could extract leaf area for well watered or low water uh, condition plants. Um, what we found was that uh, leaf area seemed to increase with both until this catastrophic drop off in soybean when they really uh, ran out of that uh, water that they needed. The tomato actually liked the low water condition, uh, so we can't call this a low water stress, unfortunately, for all three plants. Uh, and then the wheat, we saw a really strong phenotypic difference. The really important thing here is that we were extracting leaf area from an individual plant without destroying the plant uh, in the process. Um, and I wanted to point out that this was a lot of data that we collected, 120 scans. Um, that's a, a lot of high density CT scanning data that Nathaniel was able to process quite rapidly. Um, the algorithm is really on Nathaniel's side, so please ask any questions to him about it. Um, but we've split it into um, three portions and, and I, I would argue that it's relatively simple given how fast Nathaniel was able to do it, but I'll let him explain how complicated it can be. Uh, there was a pre-processing step uh, where files were converted. Uh, we had some separation because we had, had ended up uh, scanning multiple plants in a row just to make our time more efficient. We just run them all through like it was uh, sitting on the bed uh, and run through this scanner. Um, so the images were uh, resized, which I believe was to normalize in all directions. Nathaniel will correct me if I'm wrong. And then they were oriented manually. Um, although if we were doing this uh, continuously, they would all be in the same orientation. Uh, the segmentation step uh, essentially included thresholding for density of leaves versus branches, um, as well as some uh, feature engineering, which I believe was a um, expansion dilation uh, algorithm to find and fill in leaves. And then finally, there was a volume uh, calculation, surface area, and a projected area, which I'll touch on a little bit. Uh, one thing that we knew we wanted to, to test was how do we know it works? Um, so I had been trained uh, to carefully uh, measure leaf area through the scanner or picture method where you cut off individual leaves, lay them down flat, put a piece of transparency over them, take a picture and analyze it uh, in ImageJ or something like that. And that's exactly what we did, just, just showing you some of our tomato, soy, and wheat plants at that endpoint measure. Of course, we could only do this at the endpoint because this is the damaging metric uh, for leaf area. Uh, and then what I'm showing you in the plots is the traditional measure extracted from our images here, and then the CT measure. The dark points are our uh, control, or our normal water condition. The gray points are our low water. And I mess, missed my labels here, but I believe the top was soybean, the bottom's tomato, and the, or sorry, middle's tomato and the bottom is wheat. Um, and we got good correlation. We did, we were able to uh, change some settings in the algorithm uh, to optimize this correlation, because this is what we wanted to get uh, correct, because it was the only thing we had, right? Um, what we don't know is which method is more accurate. As you all know, if you're clipping off leaves, uh, especially dry, crispy, uh, dehydrated soybean leaves, you don't get a very good estimate of leaf area. Um, so we, we're actually not sure which one is the more accurate measure for leaf area, uh, but we thought correlating at the endpoint was the best way to go about this. Uh, and then something new for this, we uh, realized we could extract projected area, um, which we think could be used as an interesting phenotype, although I don't know enough about how plants reorient and, uh, uh, throughout the day uh, to acclimate to light levels, but you can see um, individual leaves and then the overlap is the uh, intensity of white in some of these images. Um, and we're able to pull that out over time as well. Um, so one thing I mentioned early was like, what if we tried to 3D print these? We have pretty good uh, additive manufacturing abilities here at APL. Um, so I thought we'd try to print some of them. We were able to recreate a whole uh, tomato plant. If you have a very good reason for why we might want to do that, let me know. Um, but there was kind of a fun demonstration of how we could uh, build up these structures after we CT scan them. 
Um, we caught the eye of some of our um, other technologists at APL who wanted to zoom in on some other plant structures. Uh, the video here, if it's playing, um, is showing you uh, the Cetaria um, spike and where the seeds attach to the surface. You can see these, um, this video is higher resolution, but some of these images of work, like the cupping structure around the seed is really cool. I don't know what to do with it yet, but we have some data uh, and may use it in the future. Uh, so please reach out if you are interested in something like this. Um, really what interests me, I'm a plant microbiome guy, especially root microbiome. So ultimately I wanted to see what was happening in the soil and how we could modify that uh, through microbiome engineering. We didn't quite get there. However, there were some cases where we could see very nice root structures. This is one of our soybeans from the um, paper. Uh, this was the star on the previous uh, experimental design image is the day after Christmas that we took this picture. We got this really nice uh, image of roots in potting soil. And we've since been able to get some for um, other grasses as well. So just to conclude, um, plants are sensitive to their environment. We think the physical response can tell us a lot about what's happening in the environment, not just for agriculture, but in um, wild plants as well. We applied CT scanning and that allowed us to um, rapidly phenotype and calculate leaf area and project area, both of which would be interesting metrics we think. Um, and ultimately it would be really cool if we could get one of these medical grade CT scanners or similar into one of the, um, you know, in the assembly line of the uh, phenotyping greenhouse, run plants through it and get data over time. So my email's here and I think that's the end. So I'll take any questions. Okay, great. Um, Nathaniel, you were, you were called out a number of times. I don't know if you want to answer uh, or, or discuss any of those. Uh, sure. Uh, let's go back to the um, the algorithm slide, Colin, if you can. Yeah. So uh, just to uh, comment on um, pre-processing, uh, specifically the sub step sub step of resizing. Uh, one reason to resize is because um, the scans, when they come out of the CT scanner, uh, they are not isotropic, right? So they are. Um, there's actually a finer resolution um, in plane as, as opposed to through plane. And so uh, to be able to calculate volumes and uh, leaf areas more easily, um, that's why the resizing step is needed. Um, as far as feature engineering, um, there are certain features, like so um, after thresholding, what happens is that you have uh, uh, various regions, uh, they're called con connected components. And um, the point of feature engineering is to be able to analyze each of those connected components and uh, pull out specific features of each of the uh, regions uh, to help you identify whether they're, they are leaves or they are some other noise. Right? And so we picked out a few features that would help with that. Um, I believe size was one of them. Um, we also, uh, as Colin mentioned, we did do some morphological operations, including dilation and erosion um, to kind of help us identify like uh, these leaves are connected through a, a small stem uh, to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the main, main stem, right? So uh, that's, that's to answer the feature engineering part of it. Um, but yeah, anyway, I think Colin gave a pretty good overview of, of um, the overall uh, algorithm. So those are just additional uh, comments. Great, thanks. Um, Alper has put a question uh, into the chat. Have you ever tried this algorithm within species? So within, uh, I guess to clarify regarding within species. So um, is this, as because, so we did three uh, groups of plants. Uh, so we had soy, wheat, and tomato. And so we did, do a, uh, we did run this algorithm on uh, multiple of the same plant type, right? So I think we, uh, if I recall correctly, we had five and we did them over four weeks. Um, oh, we had five per uh, group. So we had five controls and five uh, water stress and we did this over four weeks. 
Um, and so, yes, I guess this has been uh, used to process multiple plants of the same species. Yeah, I think the, the interest um, for a lot of the, the members, um, at least who are online, is um, in terms of plant breeding, can you use it to compare different varieties, for instance? Um, and so it sounds like you, you scan multiple plants of the same variety within the species, but not different varieties within the species. That's right. We think you could see some changes, perhaps. I mean, like you would make other, measure other things as you're uh, doing your G loss, you know, something like leaf area or projected area could be one of those quantitative metrics that you use, I think, but I would love to hear what other people are thinking as well. Um, we certainly got a good signal from our water response, but it was pretty intense for some of, some of the plants as you can see, so. Okay. Um, Scott Wild put into the, the chat, did the water stress affect the uptake of the markers or was water stress implemented after initial growth? So I believe you're asking about um, markers for the CT scanning, is that right? To get for enhancing contrast. Um, there were no markers for this, uh, the data we've shown here. This was all plants scanned directly. Uh, we, we considered adding contrast agents, especially as we were trying to look at roots. Uh, we have not had a lot of success with that yet. We're still looking at it. Uh, but all the data shown here is um, direct scans, no contrast agents uh, to get this data. Do you have anything to add on that, Nathaniel, as far as reconstruction or density compared to others that you've seen? Uh, no, I think you've, you've answered it well. Um, yeah, we didn't have any particular markers. There might have been some um, reconstruction processing that happened to uh, improve the contrast, but yeah, we didn't have any specific agents uh, to actually um, create that contrast. And Scott added, do you have plans to, to use markers in the future? We have been trying it for um, roots with varying success. Um, we've been able to resolve some roots without any markers as well. And some of our contrast agents may stick, appear to stick on soil particles more than they get taken up by roots, which can be informative too, because then you see where the soil is, but the roots aren't. Um, so right now we're still, we, we are keeping that as an option, but because we've been able to see without them, uh, it feels like adding just another variable that may not be necessary um, to see what we want to see. We think some of the moisture, con we think the moisture content of the soil is really important for being able to resolve roots, um, but we have not done that systematic study yet. We did not get roots from all of these plants or this paper would have had a section on root identification as well. Um, but some of the um, grass roots that we've seen are pretty interesting. So that's what we're focusing now. So I have a, a few questions of my own here. Uh, first of all, for those people who are not used to seeing a medical grade uh, CT scanner, um, just some basic facts like how big is it? What's the resolution? What's the throughput? What's the cost? Nathaniel, do you got those? Yeah, I can uh, take a stab at that. So uh, CT scanners, uh, fairly large. We have it's uh, for the CT scanner that we have. It has its own room because you need um, specialized, uh, you know, uh, shielding uh, because it is using X-rays to um, be able to image the object that you're scanning. Uh, so, um, but yeah, uh, gen the general medical grade CT scanner is, is like a donut with a table uh, in between, and so uh, the typical scanner would be big enough to um, scan an entire person, right? So that table is, you know, uh, wide enough for a person to lay on. Um, so uh, as far as uh, resolution, um, the general resolution for a CT scanner, uh, there is, I mean, technology is always improving, but uh, at least for the scanner that we had, um, you know, with, uh, in plane, uh, you can get generally sub millimeter uh, usually is between 0.5 to one millimeter, and then um, and then through plane, uh, you can also get less than one millimeter. Um, sometimes down to maybe 0.6 millimeters, but generally speaking, uh, through plane, that uh, resolution is is uh, 
is worse than in plane and it'll be one millimeter or more, right? So uh, that's generally how resolution goes. Um, and the basic physics behind CT scanning is, is through x-rays. Uh, every material has certain attenuation coefficients and you're trying to measure the attenuation coefficient of each material. And so contrast is, de is dependent on the material. Usually the heavier the, um, the heavier the, uh, the atoms in the material, then um, the, greater, uh, the greater attenuation that will happen. Uh, so generally speaking, that's why you don't want to have too much metal in your CT, uh, in the object that you're scanning. Um, There's a question about cost too. I think they were, the one we had was a refurbished uh, from a university hospital or something. And it was on the order of 350K or something. Don't quote me on that. It was a lot, but not like, I don't know. A lot of university medical centers will have one, uh, which is where we think a lot of people could do this type of CT scanning. Uh, the, the nice thing that we had at APL was that it was new and relatively unused. So we were able to get a lot of time on it without having to schedule around the arguably more important medical uses of the <laughs> equipment, right? Um, so we thought we had a good opportunity to use it um, and, and we're able to, to do that over the course of four weeks here. Yeah, as far as medical imaging goes, CT cost is considered maybe on the average side. Um, I mean, uh, it's fairly common, but it's not cheap compared to like ultrasound, for example. Um, and it's also not considered terribly expensive either because MRI, for example, is ten tends to be fairly expensive, right? So um, yeah, I, I don't re remember the exact cost of our scanner, but... Um, well, you know, I meant, I, I meant, if you're gonna again thinking about the audience of um, of, of this journal and of this area, um, you know, if somebody wanted to scan it up, uh, scale it up, scale it up to uh, hundreds of varieties or thousands of varieties, you know, what are the practical limitations in terms of cost and in terms of the time per scan? Yeah, the equipment itself it would be a big capital cost. The time per scan was something that we. Um, did consider and it probably took minutes per plant, but because we were doing five times six plants per condition, it probably took us a few hours of sitting with the instrument and uh, just exchanging plants. If it was built in, it's relatively fast and Nathaniel's algorithm is fast as well. Mm. We actually had some practical issues with the software tries to reconstruct in real time. So I think the idea is that whoever is running the scan can look immediately and see if uh, the person's lungs are abnormal or something, um, or if they need to repeat a scan. That we we ended up overloading the the processing pipeline and having to wait because that software was trying to reconstruct all these things for us. Uh, we think we can work around that if we wanted to stand it up. Um, no, it, it, we think we have that control of it. So from uh, Alma Fernandez, Fernandez Gonzalez, who uh, one of the leaders in the biophotonics area, uh, she's wondering about the leaf area variations for one specific plant. Are there big variations and are those dependent on the type of plant? Uh, are you talking about one, in, if you're talking about one individual plant and like multiple technical replicates of the same plant, we did not collect that data or analyze that data for this uh, set of experiments. If you're talking about the um, clonal between uh, biological or arguably the biological replicates, I wanted to pull up the data. Oh, that was the right data. Um, the soybean were extremely uh, repeatable. Like they, they got their new uh, set of leaves very repeatably and across the five replicates of plants. It was like the leaf counts and the leaf areas were very similar throughout time. It's a little bit noisier with the tomato and wheat plants, partially probably because of ability to detect. Um, but the soybeans we use, which are the Williams 82, I think were just extremely similar in their growth patterns. Um, so yes, I guess in this set of data, they were dependent on the type of plant. Uh, the beans were super repeatable and that's probably I think people would support that tomatoes were a little bit noisier and then the wheat were the hardest, um, which I think makes sense. They have the most small leaves. Maybe they are willing to sacrifice some in case of a 
a strange start or something, but it'd be interesting to hear more of what uh, people think. Did I address it, Seth? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, I, think I, I was very surprised at how similar the beans were and how by almost to the day that the new uh, leaf structures would open up between the five replicates. It was cool to watch. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to switch to the next question, then uh, come back and, and follow up on something with you. Uh, Santosh Sharma is asking, do these algorithms, uh, are they also able to work in field images with noise in the background? And can you explain the algorithm a little more? And you might need to be more specific on uh, what you mean explain the algorithm a little more uh, at uh, Santosh. So I know as we were designing our demonstration experiments here, one thing Nathaniel asked me for was uh, to make sure that the pots were full of soil because the lip of the pot was uh, looked a lot like a leaf in some of these scans. Um, and that was something that he could fix uh, as needed. But you said, if, if you can do that, then it's really easy to, to lose that. And I guess the point of bringing that up is if there's something else in the background that looks like a leaf or is another plant type, we'd have to um, do some more work to distinguish. This is a leaf that belongs to this specific plant. Do you agree with that, Nathaniel? And can you expand on yeah, some so, of the, how the no, yeah, leaf finding agree. and leaf structure works? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, there's definitely a possibility of getting false positives if you have more noise in the background. Um, uh, one specific case, uh, at least for us, was that um, in order to speed up uh, scan time, we actually did scan multiple plants uh, with one scan. And because of that, uh, we still wanted to be able to differentiate, especially different replicates of uh, the same uh, plant. So we actually had this uh, radio opaque marker that's like a number one or number two uh, that we placed beside each plant uh, to be able to at least um, visually identify which plant is, is which, right? And so those markers, um, they're actually, uh, they're helpful for us uh, visually, but as far as alg algorithmically, they're actually a challenge because they, um, you know, they, they, they are noise and they're also metal. So they also create these streaking ar artifacts in the CT scan. And so, um, you know, the algorithm is able to handle uh, those kind of artifacts, um, they're by design, but yeah, definitely you, if you can reduce the amount of noise in the background, uh, the better. Right? So I think some of those super contrasty markers, like those are like labels for different parts of the experiment. They would cause that streaking and then the low contrast of the plants, that's where Nathaniel was saying, you get those streaks and you would maybe think those are plants if you run the algorithm naively, right? But we had to fix it. Yep. Did you get to read the rest of that question? Um, well, Santosh was just following up to, to ask if whether the noise can be handled in the background. I don't think you guys addressed that for like a field situation. So we discussed trying to assign leaves to particular plants, uh, but I don't think we did that in the correct oh. Oh, I see. Uh, version of the algorithm to get it like branching patterns. That yeah, kind of so no, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the algorithm isn't designed for multiple plants at a time. It's designed for a single plant at a time. Okay, and uh, Scott Wilde says, you may have covered this uh, because this connection went out for part of the talk. In the algorithms you used to calculate leaf area, did you also calculate volume? Uh, did you use something to remove the contribution of the stem from the plant or did you have a way to identify each leaf? Yeah, so we can calculate volume. I believe we also calculated volume. Um, the thing is that uh, because of the resolution of our scanner um, being about one millimeter and the thickness of the leaves being roughly about one millimeter as well. So as far as leaf thickness goes, uh, we're not very, and, and leaf thickness as well as volume goes, um, we're not as confident as those in those metrics as in the leaf area. Um, but as far as the segmentation part of the algorithm, uh, it does uh, just get the leaf. It doesn't include stem. Uh, it might, oh, yeah. So um, as far as that goes, um, 
it is just getting purely based off uh, the leaf itself and not stem. But we are not identif I don't, uh, we are not identifying each leaf of the plant, but rather collectively. Um, and I guess that's a future step we would like to do in um, being able to identif identify each leaf. Uh, but it is a challenge because leaves could be touching each other. And because they touch each other, um, that's, yeah, that's, it, it is a challenge to be able to um, be able to tell apart leaves that are touching each other. Okay, great. Um, one thing I want that you mentioned before, I want to go back to um, looking at different sizes of leaves and comparing between plants. So you, you asked this question too, which is the most accurate measure? And you know, in computer science, you guys have all these trips, tips and tricks to do uh, various things. The one tip or trick we have, I think, in, in the plant breeding realm to compare measurements um, is just to look at consistency between replicates under the same environment. Um, so we typically will look at, you know, running a, a mixed model or something and seeing what minimizes the error variance uh, in explaining the same measurement over and over and over again. And, and therefore, you know, whatever minimizes the error variance and maximizes the genetic variances probably the better, more accurate measurement, um, just because it's consistent, right? And you can do stuff with consistency. Um, and then uh, one of the other points uh, I just might bring up is there is somewhat of a community that's used CT scans um, in, in plant sciences. So uh, I'm probably gonna miss some, but you know, Dan Chittenden is at Michigan State. He's been doing, I think a lot in this area above ground. And then I think Chris Topp and Alex Buckish and uh, Larry York have all been working on CT scans below ground. There's even a DARPA roots program, I think, on CT scanning below ground. Um, I don't know if you've interacted with any of them, but it, you know, uh, I think there is a vibrant community and it might be a good time to plug the um, North American Plant Phenotyping Network and their meeting that's coming up in February. I don't know if you guys are considering giving a talk at that, but um, it's a good place to meet some other you know, folks or expertise in this area. Uh, so thank you really for that question. No, yeah, that's good though. That's that's very helpful because, as you can see, we uh, we had a chance to do something we thought was cool, and we think it turned out cool enough. So it'd be great to share that and and learn more about what is known and what how we can push it farther, right? Yeah, yeah I really, appre yeah, really right. appreciate the references. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to send you send you those uh, those names as well. Um, but yeah, that's the cool thing about being in a new developing transdisciplinary area is a lot of people are sort of innovating different ways to do things. And then at some point you get together and talk and, you know, move the field forward. So yeah, it'd be fun. What was that? The North American Phenotyping? Plant Phenotyping Network, NAPPN. Okay. Uh, we looked at the plant vision uh, as part of the computer vision conference was one that we had found that didn't quite lined up with the timing but uh, yeah, i think that one's in scotland uh the, i think it was in california like last year okay i don't remember um yeah there's a few different groups international plant phenotyping network is is an umbrella group and then the north american plant phenotyping network is uh cool. is, is replacing in a way the pheno meeting that's gone on the last three years that was run by aspb cool. um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. If anybody would like to unmute, if you have any questions you'd like to ask orally, please do so. And if not, uh, I'd like to thank our two speakers today. Um, I'm really glad to see uh, this work that's sort of at the interface of plant sciences and computer sciences and really an important new area in phenotyping in uh, the Plant Phenome Journal. So thank you guys for sharing your work with us and we'll look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, everyone. It's a great opportunity, and thanks for your interest in the work. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your week, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.